we will be speaking on navigating the suprahyoid neck anatomy and pathology dr alok bhat is a professor of radiology specializing in neuroradiology with sub specialty focus on head and neck imaging he is a passionate educator having won the national ap cr2 outstanding teacher award in 2022 dr bhat has given multiple lectures at national and international meetings such as rsna shnr asnr and arrs he is currently the neuroradiology fellowship program director at mayo clinic in florida over to you dr alok bhat and we welcome you Thank you so much, Nivedita, for that kind introduction. Um, it's great to be here, Akshay. Thank you so much for saying this series as well. Um, let's get started here. I'm going to stop my video and then share my screen. I just need sort of a thumbs up um, once once everybody sees the screen. You guys can all see that? Yes, we can. Yes. Perfect. 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 All right. So today I'm going to be talking about navigating the suprahyoid neck anatomy and pathology. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk are to review the spaces of the suprahyoid neck. We're gonna identify the anatomy within these spaces. And we're gonna look at lesions and pathology that concur within each of these spaces. So the key is to identify the space that the lesion is in and then narrow your differential uh, by, by thinking about the anatomy that's within the space. So the suprahyoid neck extends from the spaces of the skull base, the ideal skull bases from the skull base all the way down to the level of the hyoid bone. And you can take a look at all these spaces that are involved. And, it, and at first glance, it can be very daunting uh, to take a look at this or even tackle the suprahyoid neck, but there's so many spaces in such a small confined space. But hopefully uh, during this lecture, we'll make it a little bit easier for everyone to come up with a proper differential diagnosis and identify where the lesion is within each space. So remember that the suprahyoid neck consists of three layers of the deep cervical fascia, the superficial, middle, and deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. Now, one of the key take-home points off of this slide is that remember that the carotid sheath is bounded by the superficial, middle, and the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. It's the only space that's in. Let's first start with the parapharyngeal space. The parapharyngeal space extends from the skull base to the tip of the hyoid bone, the central space, and it really only contains two things. It's fat and minor salivary gland breasts. It's surrounded, so here the paired parapharyngeal spaces, just this fat right over here. It's surrounded by that pharyngeal mucosal space medially, the masticator space anteriorly, the carotid space laterally, and then we have the carotid space just posterior to that parapharyngeal fat. Here's a 38-year-old male that presented with a right neck mass. And now normally we talk about that parapharyngeal space being displaced relative to the other spaces and, and, and figuring out where the lesion is and the spaces that are surrounding the parapharyngeal fat. But what happens when that lesion is actually within the parapharyngeal space proper? Here we have an enhancing mass sitting more within the parapharyngeal space. Uh, note that that pharyngeal mucosal space is displaced anterior medially. That masticator space is displaced anterior laterally. The parotid space is displaced posterior laterally. And that carotid space, you can see the carotid vessels are displaced posteriorly. Here's a zoomed in image that really demonstrates um, exactly what I just uh, spoke about. Let's zoom in on the coronal image right here. And you can see that this lesion within the parapharyngeal space, the fat plane really is preserved in all different directions. All the other spaces are pushed outwards. Uh, when you're trying to think about differential diagnosis, think back to what is contained within this space. You have fat and you have minor cerebral gland rests. This lesion was biopsied and it came back positive for pleomorphic adenoma or minor salivary gland rest. Next, next, let's move on to the parapharyngeal or the pharyngeal mucosal space. The pharyngeal mucosal space is a continuous mucosal sheet that extends from the nasal pharynx all the way down to the level of the hypopharynx. So here it is right here, your pharyngeal mucosal space. Remember that there's no fascia on the airway surface. So this allows for you know, all sorts of bugs and bacteria that can penetrate through this uh, pharyngeal mucosal space causing infection. This pharyngeal mucosal space contains the lymphatic ring or Waldauer's ring. So the adenoids, the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils, the minor salivary glands, which are mostly coated along the soft palate, as well as some of the constrictor muscle. Remember that the pharyngeal mucosal space is bounded posteriorly by that retropharyngeal space, and we already talked about the pharyngeal fat uh, laterally. So let's take a look at the lesion within the pharyngeal mucosal space. This is a 51-year-old male that had trouble swallowing. You can see that there's this infiltrated mass lesion that takes over the entire pharyngeal mucosa. 
extends down all the way to the level of the larynx. Now remember, our utmost um, priority is to make sure that everybody knows what's going on with the airway. So remember to comment on the airway. This is markedly, markedly narrowed. This leaves you with biopsy, and it came back positive for splenic cell carcinoma. Here's a 16-year-old, the patient that presented with fever and sore throat. So here we have a lesion, a fluid, um, a fluid attenuating or low attenuating lesion with peripheral enhancement within the right pharyngeal mucosal space. Look at a little closely, you can see a little bit of fluid in the retropharyngeal space right over here, maybe a little thickening of, um, of the pharyngeal mucosa as well, elsewhere from that, that fluid collection, and this turned out to be a tonsil abscess. So here you can see that the parapharyngeal fat right over here is displaced posterolaterally. Look at the normal left-hand side. Again, we have that fluid collection right over here. And the treatment for an abscess within the pharyngeal mucosa is either needle aspiration or incision and drainage. Next, we're going to move on to the parotid space. And this parotid space right over here extends from the mastoid tip just below the level of the angle of the mandible. It contains, obviously, the parotid glands. Remember that that facial nerve is going to dip down from that stylomastoid mastoid brain and extend it into the parotid gland as well. It contains some branches of that external parotid artery as well as the retromandibular vein, and it also contains intraparotid lesion. This parotid space is bounded or surrounded by that parapharyngeal fat right over here, which we already looked at, the masticator space anteriorly, which we will look at soon, as well as the carotid space medially right over here. So here's a lesion within the parotid space proper in a patient that presented with enlarged cystic mass. Here we have a low attenuating lesion on this axial CT image. On the coronal image, we can see that this uh, low attenuating lesion is quite large and basically takes over the entire parotid space. So while thinking of uh, diagnosis, we, we think back and we say, well, what's, what's the anatomy that's within the parotid space? So our differential diagnosis is going to include a parotid gland neoplasm, perhaps a nerve juice tumor, maybe an abnormal cystic lymph node, or maybe a continuous primary. Vascular regions can obviously occur here because we have uh, vessels. And then, of course, infection. Although already we know that it's probably not infection. This patient doesn't seem like they're sick. There's no adjacent fat stranded around here. So we got an MRI in this patient, and his T2-weighted image, we know that this is T2-weighted sequence because of the uh, high T2 signals in the PSF. Uh, you can see that this lesion is relatively high in T2 signals. Post contrast images demonstrate some enhancement within the lesion, more so medially. Let's go back to our CT image. If you look a little bit closely, you can see that this low attenuating lesion within the left parotid space, it also widens that stylomastoid foramen on the left hand side. Don't believe me? Let's switch over to the bone window. You can see the normal stylomastoid foramen over here. The cortex is preserved. You can see that this clear widening of that stylomastoid foramen right over here. And this turned out to be a facial nerve shrunk. Here's a male that presented with right parotid swelling. Here on this non-contrast image, we see this lesion that has irregular spiculated borders. We give contrast right over here. And the peripheral margins are very, again, irregular, but the peripheral margins enhance as well. So now we go back to a differential diagnosis. Think about the anatomy that lies within the parotid space. So our differential is going to include a parotid space neoplasm, nerve sheath tumor, which we already looked at the case, an abnormal lymph node, a vascular lesion, or perhaps infection. This lesion uh, was ultrasounded, and you can see relatively hypocoded lesions. It does have internal flow, so now we're thinking, you know, maybe an abnormal lymph node or parotid gland neoplasm, uh, and this turned out to be a mucoepidermal carcinoma. Here's another patient with a left parotid mass, and you can see that there is a uh, high T2 signal lesion within the superficial left lobe of the parotid gland. We have three in post-contrast images. You can see enhancement of this lesion, a little bit of speculation posteriorly right over here, and this turned out to be another mucoepidermal carcinoma. So whenever you have tumors that involve uh, the parotid gland and you end up with a, a, a mucoepidermal carcinoma, make sure that you always look for a perineural spread of disease as well. So follow that facial nerve all the way back into that stylomastoid foramen. Here's a patient that has a history of multiple sclerosis. So we were scanning the brain and we just had this incidental finding um, within the parotid space. Here we have a high T2 signal lesion within the right parotid space. You can see there's more of a, of a nodular component along the lateral margin. We went ahead and we gave contrast, and you can see that that, that nodular portion does uh, enhance quite avidly. That cystic portion uh, does not, and you can see there's some enhancement along the entire peripheral margin of the lesion itself. Uh, this turned out to be a working tumor. Here's another patient that had history of squamous cell carcinoma with the left base. The patient underwent parotidectomy, and this is just a follow-up exam. Uh, you can see that there are post changes to that left base, that parotid 
a gland has been uh, taken out, there's this matting of the regional soft tissues. But as we're going to do with that mucoepidermal carcinoma, we're going to do the same thing in patients with a history of squamous cell carcinoma. We have to trace that facial nerve all the way back intracranially. So we go ahead and do that. And then unfortunately, we see abnormal enhancement of that facial nerve right over here. Note that the normal right-hand side doesn't enhance. We follow it back intracranially. You can also see abnormal enhancement of the facial nerve within the internal auditory canal. Here's the normal right. So remember that that facial nerve takes a seventh, or that seventh cranial nerve takes a seventh uh, type of course within that temporal bone. So you have the labyrinth vein segment right over here, the anterior geniculate ganglion here, which also enhances and is abnormal, and then you have the deep panic segment uh, extending out loud. And this was a case of perineural strative tumor, unfortunately recurrent residual disease in this patient. Now let's move on to the masticator space. Remember that the masticator space extends from the temporal parietal calvarium to the mandibular angle right over here. It contains the muscles of mastication. So you have your masseter, your medial lateral pterygoids, as well as the temporalis muscle. It also contains the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. It also contains the ramus and posterior body of the mandible right over here. And it also has the pterygoid venous plexus. So this area is very rich in venous vasculature. It's surrounded by that parapharyngeal fat just posteriorly, which we already looked at, as well as the parotid space, which we looked at as well. Let's take a look at a few lesions within the masticator space. So this is a patient that presented with trismus. Here we have this food collection with peripheral enhancement. It's abutting that lateral margin of the mandible sitting right uh, within the, the, the masseter muscle. You can see a little bit of focus of, of air here on the coronal image. There's clear thickening of that platysmal muscle, and a stranding both superficial and deep to the front. And this turned out to be an abscess. Remember that the most common etiology for uh, abscess at the level of the masticator space is odontogenic etiology. So as soon as you find an abscess here, remember to check the teeth as a potential source. So if we look at the bone window here, the right side normal, the left side you can see that the patient has developed a periapical abscess, which has busted out of that cortex into that masticator space, causing this uh, ripple and infection. Here's a patient that presented with left face fullness, a 12-year-old. Um, again, remember that the masticator space is rich in vasculature. Uh, it has the, the pterygoid venous plexus, just a little clue to, to the diagnosis. But here we can see that this lesion really is high in T2 signal that's centered within the masticator space. But look carefully, this is actually a transspatial mass. You can see that it extends over into the buccal space over here, extends into the lip. There's also a component that ex extends into the pharyngeal mucosa and posteriorly to the level of the parotid space right over here as well, and probably the parapharyngeal fat. Here's the pre and the post contrast images, and this lesion does demonstrate enhancement. And so once you hear transpatial, once you hear this high in T2 signal and it enhances, you need to think about a venous malformation. That's exactly what this is. Here's a patient that presented with a right facial mass. You can see this uh, mass right here that's uh, sitting right within the master muscle, that lateral aspect of the masticator space. Clearly, this lesion enhances right over here. Um, and the diagnosis here was squamous cell carcinoma. So just like in the parotid space, if you hear a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma, remember that you must follow that nerve that's involved within that space and extend all the way cranially. So that's exactly what we did. Um, we're going to look for perineural spread in this, um, in this case. And so we're going to track our eye along the mandibular division of that trigeminal nerve. The coronal image here demonstrates that there's abnormal enhancement of that mandibular division followed cranially through that pyramidal valley up to the cavernous sinus, look at the normal left-hand side. For those of you that don't believe this is abnormal, take a look at the PET scan. Clearly hypermetabolic, that primary lesion right over here. And you can also see that there's abnormal thickening and enhancement that can be the division of trigem, a case of perineal spread from squamous cell carcinoma. Now let's move on to the retropharyngeal space. This retropharyngeal space is a posterior midline space that extends from the skull base all the way down to the upper mediastinum, up to the whole about level of T3, T4. Now remember that it's bounded by this lateral fascial wall called the palatal fascia. The retropharyngeal space has mainly two things. It contains fat and lymph nodes. And it's that lateral group that we typically hear about, the nodes de Rouvier. The medial group rarely do we see on, on, on imaging. Remember that the retropharyngeal space is surrounded by the pharyngeal uh, space right over here anteriorly. Uh, the danger space, which we'll, which we'll get to in a little bit, and then the carotid space is just posterior laterally right over here. So here's a patient that presented with swelling and neck pain and fever. 
Um, clearly, there's a peripherally enhancing fluid collection within the retropharyngeal space right over here. And this is the case of the retropharyngeal abscess. And that brings us to the differential diagnosis for fluid in the retropharyngeal space. Here's a patient that presented with this vague, ill-defined neck pain. We can clearly see that this fluid was in the retropharyngeal space. Look at this axial CT image here. You get this sort of nice bow tie configuration of fluid within the retropharyngeal space. You know that you're in this space because what ends up happening is you displace that pharyngeal mucosa anteriorly and you displace the longus coli posteriorly, cluing you in that this is fluid within the retropharyngeal space. So whenever you see fluid within this space, I need you to think about four different uh, differentials. Acute calcific tendonitis in the longus coli, pharyngitis, post treatment changes in the neck, patients that have had um, head and neck cancer that have been radiated, and then always take a look at your vein because IJ thrombosis can cause fluid as well. So here in this patient right over here, what can be causing this retropharyngeal fluid? There's a little bit of a clue here on the soft tissue windows. You can see maybe this um, abnormal high attenuation that really doesn't belong here. Here's the anterior arch of C1. Here's C2, but what if I did this and I switched over the bone window? Now the answer is clear. This is amorphous calcifications right at the level of C1, C2. You have your diagnosis, and this is a case of acute calcific tendonitis. And the key points to remember here is that radiologically, these patients will present with these amorphous calcifications, typically at C1, C2, and they'll also have retropharyngeal fluid. It's not an ENT emergency. Clinically, it's managed conservatively. Patients may be given NSAIDs just for pain relief, and, and, and sometimes they have a low-grade temp that needs to be taken care of, but this is a non-surgical entity. All right, here's another patient with fluid in the retropharyngeal space. So there's a little bit of fluid right over here posteriorly. You can see on the sagittal image that there is indeed fluid within the retropharyngeal space. This patient also had trouble swallowing or fever. If you take a look closely, you can see that there's also a thickening of the pharyngeal mucosa right over here. The palatine and the lingual tonsils enhance, uh, and this is a case of pharyngitis. So in cases of pharyngitis, you may see thickening of the pharyngeal mucosa, and that retropharyngeal fluid is just reactive. Again, a non ent emergency. The fluid collection doesn't enhance. Uh, it'll resolve on its own when the pharyngitis uh, resolves as well. Here's a patient with sinonasal carcinoma. You can see this large mass right over here in the sinonasal cavity, clearly hypermetabolic. And here's what happens in the post-treatment setting. You see this featureless pharynx. Um, and then the axial CT, you can see some, some retropharyngeal fluid right over here on the sagittal image. We can see it. It's just a little bit traced. Again, we're going to think back to our differential. There are four things that we're going to think about with fluid in the retropharyngeal space. And this is a case of just normal post-treatment changes. So radiologic findings that you can see in the post-radiated neck is fluid within the retropharyngeal space. You may see thickening of that platysmal muscle. This patient also has some stranding and reticulation of that, both superficial and deep, that platysmal muscle. And oftentimes you see this robust heterogeneous enhancement of the submillimeter bones. So again, this is a, a normal finding in the post-radiated neck. Here's a patient with a chronic infilling catheter. We see fluid within the retropharyngeal space right over here. Once you see fluid in the retropharyngeal space, make sure you interrogate the venous vessels. So here we take a look at the internal jugular veins right over here. Follow the right internal jugular vein down to the SVC. There's clear thrombus within that SVC. You can see that catheter that's sort of packed out along the, the, the posterior aspect of the vessel. Again, here's our differential right over here, and this obviously turned out to be a case of IJ thrombosis. Radiologic findings, don't be afraid if you see retropharyngeal fluid, but as soon as you see it, make sure you interrogate those vessels, as I mentioned before. Associations include these chronic infilling catheters and central lines. You can also see them for infections such as Meniere syndrome or uh, metastasis. Here's a patient with left-handed weakness, and this is just an incidental finding, but it really reminds us that um, and patients that come in with left-handed weakness, you know, oftentimes we get a CT angiogram, head and neck, perfusion. There's so many images to take a look at. Remember to switch over to that soft tissue window. You'd be surprised at what you can find. Um, unfortunately, this patient had a large right retropharyngeal lymph node that's clearly abnormal. Had an enhances on the right-hand side with the normal left-hand side. So now we're going to look for other abnormalities. Scroll a little bit further, and you see this um, solid cystic lymph node right over here at level 2 and 3. Don't stop there. You need to find the origin of this lesion. Why does this patient have um, these necrotic nodular lymph nodes that are scattered uh, within the neck? Well, take a look at the, the neck base. You have to remind yourself to read through that streak artifact. Those shoulders can create a little bit of problem in terms of detecting abnormalities right at that neck base. But there's clearly this permeative, infiltrative, fast lesion within the right thyroid lobe. Look at the normal left-hand side. 
a placenta case of thyroid carcinoma in a patient with lymph node metastasis. All right, next we're going to look at the carotid space. The carotid space extends from the carotid, um, from the carotid canal right at the skull base all the way down um, to the level of the aortic arch. It co its contents include the internal carotid artery, the internal jugular vein, and cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12 within the suprahyoid. It's surrounded medially by that retropharyngeal space, the parotid space laterally, the paraphrangeal fat anteriorly, and the perivitreal space posteriorly. So here's a patient with a carotid space lesion, patient presented with left neck pain. So I'm going to look at the vessels within the carotid space itself, not just around it, but clearly you can see that there's a flap within the internal carotid artery, uh, extensive pseudoaneurysm along that internal carotid artery as well. And this is a case of left internal carotid artery dissection with pseudoaneurysm formation. Here's a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome. The patient was on chemotherapy and presented with this vague, ill-defined neck pain, a little bit of a, a, a fever as well. So this is a, a subtle case, but history can sort of clue you into the diagnosis and just being aware of this, this, this entity. Um, if you take a look at the right carotid here and the left carotid here, you can see that there's a little bit of a haziness around that uh, left internal carotid artery. Take a look at the sagittal, there's this rind of soft tissue attenuation that it crawls up that internal carotid artery. And this is a case of typic syndrome or carotid dinian. Patients typically present with this vague neck pain that's tender to palpation typically at the level of the carotid bifurcation. Uh, treatment is very empiric. Um, uh, typically, patients are treated with either NSAIDs or steroids, uh, and um, the symptoms typically resolve within 10 to 14 days. So imaging, you're going to see thickening of that wall. You may see some subtle fat straining around there. Oftentimes, you can see enhancement of that wall, all that carotid artery um, with, with vessel wall imaging. All right, so let's take a look at this patient. Uh, that has a history of, of trauma. This patient was um, evaluated with a CT angiogram uh, to look for active contrast excitization. So when you take a look at the vessels, you know, you see, all right, so internal, external, internal, external. So what's this abnormal blob of enhancement right over here between the, um, the internal and the external carotid arteries? This is abnormal. Take a look at the parasagittal image. Clearly, there's an abnormal mass lesion that's playing that internal and the external carotid arteries right over here. And this turned out to be a case of carotid paracanidia. It's the most common of the paragangliomas within the head and neck. It's a slow growing painless mass. It's gonna splay the internal and the external carotid arteries as it gets larger. Here's another patient with a slow growing painless right neck mass. Here we have a low T1 signal lesion right here, but as opposed to the other case, look at the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery vessels. They're displaced anteriorly. We have contrast, clearly this mass enhances very avidly. It's a little bit heterogeneous on T2-weighted sequences. On a sagittal image, we can see how nicely the internal and the external carotid arteries are pushed anteriorly. And this was a case of a vagal paraganglioma. It's the least common of the paragangliomas within the head and neck. It's a slow growing painless mass. And it may present with hoarseness due to vocal cord paralysis because it involves the vagus nerve. And we already talked about how there's anterior displacement of the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery together. Now we're, doing, we're a little bit of a sort of a, a pearl. We're slowly sort of shifting away from um, like a, like a, a glomus tumor. Now we just typically say vagal paraganglion. And remember to look for this high T2 signal, the internal flow voids, and avid enhancement uh, on your post contrast image. Here's a 67-year-old with an incidental finding within the left carotid space. We can see this high T2 signal lesion within the left carotid space. It's low on T1, and clearly this lesion enhances. That parasagittal image really is a clue to our diagnosis. We can see that this is a very oblong in appearance and it tracks along the expected course of that vagus nerve, and this turned out to be a schwannoma. So commonly, schwannomas are an incidental finding within the head and neck, uh, typically intermediate to high in T2 signal, homogeneous enhancement, and you may see cystic changes if they're large. All right, now let's move on to the perivertebral space. That perivertebral space extends from the skull base all the way down to the level of the mediastinum to about the level of T4. Here's our perivertebral space right over here. It contains the muscles, the longus coli, the capitis muscles, the scalene muscles. It will also contain the phrenic nerve, the vertebral artery, and the vertebral body. 
And of course, in the paraspinal component, you're gonna have the muscles and the posterior elements of that vertebral thigh. It's surrounded by that retropharyngeal space right over here, the carotid space out laterally, as well as that posterior cervical space more laterally over. Here's a patient that presented with swelling and pain. Uh, after a little bit of uh, digging into the history, apparently the patient had some sort of, you know, a pimple or scab that they were they were picking at. And this is um, this is their CT imaging scan with contrast. You can see that there's sort of this cleat of fluid uh, that's 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 extending through that uh, perivertebral space right over here. I don't see any personally enhancing fluid collection, but clearly there's some fat stranding within the subcutaneous fat as well. And this is a case of perivertebral cellular disease. Key here is to remember that. If you have infection or a process that's within the perispinal region, remember that this infection can extend easily into that spinal canal. So make sure you look very carefully uh, within the spinal canal. If you're unsure if there's something there or, or you think that there may be something there, go ahead and recommend an MRI of the cervical spine with contrast. All right, so this patient presented with a right neck lump. You can see that there's a fat attenuating lesion uh, that's insinuating within the perispinal muscles right over here on the right hand side. A, a little bit of a closer view on the, uh, the parasatchel and the coronal images right over here. Again, remember that the periventricular space contains fat and muscles. Uh, this is a fat attenuating lesion. There's no nodularity in it. There's no real enhancement within the lesion as well. And this turned out to be a run-of-the-mill uh, light lesion. All right, now let's walk into the danger space. The danger space is a potential space that extends from the skull base all the way down to the level of the diaphragm. But we don't really see this on imaging unless it's unless, unless there's some sort of pathology within that danger space. Remember that the retropharyngeal space empties into the danger space via a trap door at the level of T3 and T4. And its contents is really this, this sort of loops of connective tissue. And as we mentioned before, it's bounded by that retropharyngeal space anteriorly and the perivertebral space posteriorly. Here's a patient that presented with um, asthma and had an asthma a, a, a attack. Probably an increase into thoracic pressure, and then had this this um, uh, emphysema that was dissecting the medial steinum up into into the neck. But uh, I love this case because it really um, outlines the fascial anatomy within the suprahyoid neck. Uh, here we can see the the anterior um, or the alar fascia right over here, uh, which is just um, anterior to that danger space located right over here, uh, and of course that retropharyngeal space right over here. Um, the sagittal image really demonstrates the location of that uh, danger space. Um, and you can see that alar fascia that, that, that's causing this image. So here's that mediastinal emphysema. Um, and then, of course, uh, remember that trap door. We can kind of see it right over here, uh, right at the level of T3, T4, where, um, where that retropharyngeal space uh, dumps it into the, into the danger space. So let's take a look at a case that involves a danger space. Here's a 21-year-old that presented with this right lower dental pain. Uh, we look at the oral cavity, and you can see this peripheral enhancing fluid collection to floor the mouth on the right-hand side. Remember, if you have an oral cavity lesion or an oral cavity infection, obviously take a look at the CT. We can see these periapal abscesses involving uh, uh, the adjacent tooth. That tooth was extracted, um, but unfortunately, the patient presented back to the ED about 12 days later, and, and the infection progressed. You can see these um, abnormal fluid collections, both within the retropharyngeal space and the danger space, and unfortunately, the patient succumbed uh, to, to, to the infection. So infection within the danger space can be extremely painful, deadly, and extremely uh, painful. All right, so here's a summary of the suprahyoid neck. We looked at a lot of anatomical spaces and a lot of anatomy, uh, but hopefully we were able to distill it out. So key here is to identify the space in where, to which the lesion occurs in, uh, and then think about the anatomy that's within the space. And then you can narrow your differential and usually um, come up with a quick with the correct diagnosis and then you get one or two um, entities on your differential. So remember that the paraphangeal space contains fat and minor salivary glands. So think about uh, lipomas, liposarcomas, and minor salivary gland tumors such as your pleomorphic tumors. The pharyngeal mucosal space contains that lymphatic and ring and also minor salivary glands. So don't be surprised to get minor salivary gland uh, tumors in this, in this region as well. Um, it's often left behind. Um, we don't think about this often until we biopsy it and, and it comes back as, as, as a pleomorphic adenoma or something of the sort. Obviously, lymphoma can occur in this re region. And remember that um, this is a source of uh, uh, infection where bacteria and bugs and um, uh, viruses can, can, can get into, um, into, into the neck. We looked at the parotid space, which obviously contains the parotid gland, but don't forget that facial nerve. Remember that it tracks out of that stylomastoid foramen and it really tracks right behind that. Um, 
retromandibular vein. It obviously contains lymph nodes as well. So if you see an abnormal um, enlarged lymph node, um, you know, think about maybe a cutaneous primary at the level of the um, at the level that parotid space or maybe the scalp. Uh, we might be the first ones to, to, to find these lesions. Uh, in the masticator space, we looked at muscles and mastication. Remember that that mandibular nerve uh, extends out that foramen ovale into the masticator space. So track that nerve all the way back to the pathology uh, that's involved in the masticator space. Don't forget that pterygoid venous plexus uh, that's sitting there as well. We looked at the retropharyngeal space. Um, remember that the retropharyngeal space contains fat um, and, and some you know subcentimeter lymph nodes. If you have fluid within the retropharyngeal space, Remember that we talked about a few things to, to look for, or a few things that should be in differential, um, acute calcific tendonitis for longus coli. Make sure you look at your internal jugular vein for thrombosis. Take a look at the history of this. Make sure the patient hasn't had a history of prior radiation in the setting of, of uh, head and neck cancer. And we also learned that infection uh, can cause uh, inflammatory uh, edema or fluid within the retropharyngeal space. The carotid space contains the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. It also contains the cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12. So again, make sure um, that you track your, your eye all the way back up to that carotid space if you think it's involving the nerve. Uh, we learned about the perivertebral space, which contains muscles and fat. The key here is, is if you have a lesion within the perivertebral space, make sure you track your eye into the spinal canal, uh, looking for any abnormalities within the canal as well. And then we learned about the danger spaces, the potential space where uh, infection can gain access. Uh, and an infection, if, if it does leach this space, uh, it's often um, not fatal, unfortunately. So with that, I thank everyone for their attention. Uh, this was sort of a world in pulling a super high right neck. Um, any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you for such a wonderful talk. There are a few questions like this for you. So, uh, we want to know what is the difference between typic versus atherosclerosis. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so, you know, a lot of times, the atherosclerotic, one of the more atherosclerotic diseases isn't, um, isn't going to present with uh, this vague, ill-defined um, uh, neck pain. Anecdotally, I see typic or transient perivascular inflammation of the, of the carotid artery in patients that are immunocompromised, um, that are, you know, have been radiated or, 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 or with chemotherapy. Um, look very carefully. What I do is I take a look at the rest of the vessels as well, just to make sure that there isn't, um, you know, uh, extensive atherosclerotic disease. It would be a little bit hard to do this entity. Um, but if you suspect typic, um, go ahead and get an MRI, get, get vessel wall imaging. Um, go ahead and, and look for that that abnormal thickening or that enhancement uh, along that wall. That that'll that'll help you as well. Um, and the other thing is, is the good part is, is you know, if they do have this vague neck pain and you don't see a dissection, you don't see anything else, suggest it. Um, and you know, after 10, 14 days, they'll probably say, you know, this 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 pain's resolved. Okay. So uh, the next question is, um, we want you to demonstrate the tonsillolingual sulcus anatomy. Yeah. So the so the tonsillolingual sulcus anatomy. What I typically do is is I um I, I track my 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 eye back towards that towards that tongue base and I look at the glossal tonsillar sulcus and I try to often find that. It can be a little bit hard because all the soft tissues are, um, are, 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 um, are, are matted together. Um, I encourage you when you're taking a look at your post-treatment neck cases, um, you know, patients that have had the, the tongue base resected, um, take a look at those. Unfortunately, I don't have a um, really, really good example um, to highlight that in here. But, but when you guys read, um, read your cases, take a look at that, and you'll be able to nicely delineate that, that anatomy in, in, in um, uh, post-treatment neck cases. What's what's your experience when you did that with that? I think those are the best ones for for people to um to take a look at the anatomy. Yeah, and they also want you to suggest some articles to understand these next cases. Yeah, absolutely. So that I would have to actually track back into um into, into my folder, but I'm happy to, to send um uh, those 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 articles to, to you guys in that, in that in that. Yeah, and uh, some more of anatomy they want from your end uh, regarding floor of mouth. How to exactly see on MRI intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of tongue? So yeah. that, uh, that's going to be a little bit hard. I'm trying to think of it like a like a case that I that I that I that I have with with that as well. The way that I remember it is, you know, if you lift up your tongue, I I define that as as as, as the as the floor of the mouth. Um, 
and then anything that's 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 deeper, obviously you want to have your junior bosses, junior Ohio complex, um, and then obviously your mile Ohio at this point, which is going to separate the sub linear space from the sub um, linear space. And told you that's as 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 as, as some of you guys know, that's a that's an entirely um, uh, yeah, it's a different topic. Different topic. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's that's I can speak for maybe another hour on that. But I can suggest. Let me write this down really quickly, and I can I can send up an article um, on that as well. Is that okay? I can do it. Um, I can send out share those articles, and people will be able to see a link or, or something of the sort. Yeah. So basically, the floor of mouth is the mylohyoid. Other things are the supporting structures. So if you get to see the mylohyoid wells, then that's the floor of mouth. And intrinsic extrinsic muscles of tongue that uh, you need MRI images for us to demonstrate. Then ITF versus masticator state. You want to give an info on that? You want to have an. Repeat the question again, you cut out. ITF versus masticator state. IT, ITF? Yeah, infratemporal fossa. Versus... Oh, infratemporal fossa. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Infratemporal fossa. Yeah, so what I do is I. So that masticator space can be. Oh, it's oh, pretty much. Supertemporal um, fossa and the infratemporal fossa, and I typically delineate that with the with the zygomatic arch. Um, I think that's a great point. Um, whoever asked that question, that yeah, if you have infection within the masticator space, um, make sure you obviously track your eye all the way up, um, up, up that um, uh, zygoma up into the the, the temporal scalp as, as well, because you're absolutely right. Um, lesions, tumors, um, you know, all sorts of abnormalities can can um, can it you know, extend in, in two different ways, but it's just a way of Separating that that masticator space into into the two different um, uh, compartments. It's yeah, like sort of that that it's sort of like the same thing with like um your pre styloid space and your post styloid um space. You know that that is basically um one you know paraphyngeal space uh, uh, combined, but now we separate into into the, the parotid space and paraphyngeal fat. Yeah, I think the basic difference between the two is that um, the masseter muscle is a part of masticator space, whereas uh, it is not a part of the infratemporal fossa. So anything medial to the ramus from the mucosal space is uh, what is the content of infratemporal fossa, excluding the masseter muscle. Yeah, and that's a great point you bring up as well. And I think it's also important to remember that, you know, I feel like there's, it's important to understand the way that the surgeons speak as well. Um, because what ends up happening is sometimes the, the, the surgeons will have a different way of identifying landmarks and spaces um, than, than we do and, and, and the way that we take a look at um, the, the, the anatomy. And sometimes the stuff is, is construed as synonymous, and then sometimes it's, it's considered um, different as well. But I, I'm sure that's, that's been your experience as well, maybe. Is that correct? So uh, the next question to you is how to differentiate vagal schwannoma from paragangliomas based on carotid vessel displacement? Yeah, so I look at, um, you know, so vagal schwannomas versus vagal paraganglomas can be hard. Um, there, there are a few tricks that you can use. And first of all, schwannomas tend to not advance that, that avid, um, avidly. Glomus tumors, actually, actually when you say glomus tumors, you're probably just, you're, um, still running away from that, that terminology. But paragangliomas in, um, enhance intensely and very, very avidly. Um, so those are two different. The other thing that you can use if you get a little bit, um, a little bit confused, is sometimes ASL imaging can help. Um, you know, if you use arterial spin labeling, um, uh, your your paraganglioma's are going to light uh, light up like like gangbusters. Um, Schwannomas uh, tend tend to not do that as as, as nicely. And then you can obviously use um, uh, use your medicines typically too if, if if you need help on that. But but usually you can tell. Yeah. So uh, the next question is, what's the cause of uh, Ludwig's angina, and how can it be seen? On CT scan and in which spaces? Yeah, so Ludwig's angina is defined as a, a rapidly um, spreading infection that typically occurs right at the at the, at the floor of the mouth and extends posteriorly, um, you know, causing rapid rapid um, airway compromise. I think, and the way that I approach it, and the way that I approach my scans is, if you see infection that involves the floor of the mouth, uh, the oral cavity, and you think that the airway is going to be compromised, or you think there's a little bit of unodema there. I will put in there that you know um, uh, signs are concerning for developing Ludwig's angina, um, and and just make sure that you you monitor the, the, the patient and then clinician if you get it this is you know like we'll, we'll we'll make sure that we um uh, we we carefully monitor the patient the patients uh, um, carefully monitored monitored um, just in case there is um, airway airway compromise. Okay, so the next question: How to differentiate lymph node levels two and three? 
Yeah, so two and three. So that um, what I do is I look at the the, um, the, the, the hyoid bone, um, and it can be a little bit um, hard. Uh, anything higher than the hyoid bone is going to be a level two. Um, anything inferior from the hyoid bone um, uh, down to the level of the inferior margin of the glycoid is going to be level three. Um, uh, again, you know, sometimes what ends up happening is is uh, lymph nodes really don't care, right? It's not going to say, okay, well, today I'm going to be like, I'm going to pick either two or three. Sometimes you have to, you have, I will say literally two slash three, um, because that lymph node crosses that hyoid, hyoid border. And also remember the patient positioning matters too, right? Because if you scan a patient with their arms up, um, sometimes that lymph node gets, gets you know, flipped into one category or another, and then you scan the patient with the arms down, and that, that lymph node gets flipped into, into another um, uh, lymph node station. So just be wary of that. Um, but I, I think it's okay to write you know, two slash three if it's sort of like straddling that, that, that hyoid. Okay, so they want you to answer the difference between styalgia and eagle syndrome. What's the other one? The first one? Eagle styalgia. Styalgia. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I love styalgia. I haven't, I haven't heard um, that 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 term before. Um, Eagle syndrome. Uh, we just talk about you know an elongated styloid process that may um, cause you know sort of this this, this pain, this ill-defined area of, of you know, vague um, big 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 symptoms. Um, we put measurements if there is clinical concern for um, uh, uh, Eagle syndrome. Uh, in, for, in terms of that, that styloid process, um, there are various numbers that are written out there. Um, I like to go by 2.5. If it's less than 2.5, I say, you know what, it's not really enlarged. If it's 2.6, 2.7, then I say, I say um, you know, borderline enlarged, and then they have to use the clinical history. Um, oftentimes, these patients will come in with just, you know, compression of that jugular vein or, you know, compression of vessels or whatever else, and we really have to do dynamic imaging, you know, have them turn their head. You might you might find something that that um, you couldn't get in the in the intro position. Okay, so uh, one of the attendees wants to know uh, what is the reason of symptomatology in the thyroid gland cancer case that you show. It wasn't, and that's exactly it, right? So that was a that was actually a patient presenting with left um I think it was left hand weakness. So it was something that was that was that that, that clinicians were worried about stroke. So we got a CT angiogram head and neck. So the point of that case was. You know, yeah, obviously look at the vessels in the CT angiogram, um, but, but you'd be surprised at, at what else, um, what, what you, you'll, you'll find. I mean, we've seen um, laryngeal cancers, we've seen nasopharyngeal cancers, um, uh, semicircle canal dehiscence um, on, on CT angiograms of head and neck, PEs, obviously, you know, we have vocal cord paralysis we've seen due to, due to this large, you know, mass that we see and just on the, the tip of the, 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 um, the, the apex. Um, so yeah, the take home point for that that slide is always switch over to your soft tissue windows. Make sure you interrogate the the, um, the pharynx, the larynx. Make sure that there aren't any abnormal lymph nodes. Um, make sure that the, 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 the thyroid is okay as well, because all these are that was completely incidental finding. The patient had no idea that they had um, papillary thyroid cancer. So we we turned unfortunately a, a, a stroke case into um, cancer workup. Okay, and the last question to you. Uh, what's the difference between the sites of lingual and palatine tonsils? Yeah, so so the way that I do it is, is I think you know I work my way back over to the soft palate and I kind of curve my way around, and and those sort of those laterally sort of marginated sort of you know rounded structures are your palatine tonsils. If you want to take a look at your lingual tonsils, you can go all the way down to your neck base, almost to the level of the follicula, and you can see those 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 lingual tonsils that are sort of sort of hanging out there. But for all intents and purposes, lingual tonsils, palatine tonsils. Uh, tongue base, that's all considered uh, oral pharynx uh, as, as, a, as a site. Okay. So, and uh, finally, we just want you to suggest any anatomy reference articles for MR anatomy of neck, um, basically. Yeah. Usually they come in combo, honestly. What ends up happening is there's a CT image and, a, and, a, and an MRI image. Um, what's you know, what's the best way to send? I can certainly send off literally, and in, in, you know, once we finish this talk, I can I can send off a few um, anatomy articles of of what seems to be like oral cavity. Um, what else did I write down? Some of some of the other spaces that we discussed here as well, um, so that people can can read a little bit more about it. Should I should I send um, actually a, a few of the few of the articles on a mail? Yes, that should be fine. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. That was a wonderful lecture. I hope to see you again.
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope everybody enjoy the lecture and, and, and we keep you on learning. You have definitely said and commented on that. It's, a, it's been a wonderful lecture and it was a lovely lecture to listen to. Thank you. Of course. Of course, of course. If there's any questions, feel, please feel free to email, reach out, and I'll do my, my best to, to, to help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.